Coming up next on KPBS Evening Edition, San Diego voters will make some big decisions about the city's future. We'll have a look at the issues as we head toward the next election. Also tonight, huge waves shut down the Ocean Beach Pier. Lifeguards say it'll be a dangerous weekend on the coast. And a San Diego-based Navy ship rescues fishermen from suspected pirates in the Northern Arabian Sea. Plus, the battle over seals at the La Jolla Children's Pool is going back to court. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Peggy Pico. A storm system out of the Pacific is creating some huge waves along the San Diego County coastline. The Ocean Beach Pier had to be closed for several hours today because of the waves and the high tide. KPBS video journalist Katie Euphrat gives us a look at this day at the beach. The waves are just amazing. It's the biggest I've seen ever. I have a day off, so I was going to go for a, a nice, peaceful surf, and then I see crowds of people, and Ocean Beach is never crowded like this, and that's why. <laughs> it, it looks like death. Uh, I'd hope to make it out and come back with my board. Broken wrist from surfing. The, the critical nature of the rescues we make on days like today are just much more dangerous. One of the most dangerous things are for people that aren't necessarily intending on being in the water, but find themselves in the water or hit by a large volume of, of, of water and then get flushed into the, the surf or pounded against cliffs. So somewhere in California, uh, I'm pretty sure that's going to happen and somebody's most likely going to lose their life. Instead of wasting all my energy paddling around through high tide, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait a little bit and get the breaking waves. So you are going to surf later today? Oh, 100 percent, yes, yes. <laughs> tide dropped a little bit, like I said. It's pumping pretty hard still, and um, you know, it's not looking as slow. Uh, it's a little crazy through the inside, but through the channel we should be okay, and uh, you know, I'm hoping for the best. Paddle out there, and hopefully get a couple there. It's pretty gnarly out there. Uh, surf is pretty big. It's about 10, 15 feet on a set. Uh, Getting sucked into the cove over here sucks. It's not fun. It's a real pain to get out. Uh, the guys over here are having a lot of fun catching some big sets and stuff. So, should we go? We got a few heads out there, but nothing major on the crowd. Actually, there's more people watching it. It's a little spectator sport today, so it means it's a good thing. It means it's big and it's pumping, and um, we'll make it happen. That story from KPBS videographer Katie Euphrat. Lifeguards say the high surf also created six to seven foot drops in the sand along Mission Beach. Here's a look at the surf predictions from Surfline.com. Up to 14 feet at Horseshoe and La Jolla and up to 13 feet at Sunset Cliffs. The Weather Service has a high surf advisory in effect until 4 p.m. tomorrow. Another lawsuit is filed over harbor seals at the La Jolla Children's Pool. A group called the La Jolla Friends of Seals is suing to force the city of San Diego to close the children's pool from December to May for the seals' pupping season. The group says the city council approved closing the beach in 2010, but the mayor and city attorney have ignored that decision. They want the court order to enforce the closure. You know, most of the people that are getting this close to the seals actually like the seals. Um, they're not trying to get rid of the seals. They, they come there to watch the seals and see the seals. Um, but there needs to be a management plan in place so people aren't getting so close that they're driving the seals into the water and causing them to separate, uh, causing mothers to separate from their pups. And this has been one of the worst uh, pupping seasons ever because there's been a concerted effort, um, a few Individuals from East County have been coming out and setting up beach open umbrellas and tents and flags and trying to encourage the public to basically occupy the beach so that the seals can't, can't haul up and rest. The issue of closing the children's pool has been the subject of multiple lawsuits. The California Coastal Commission is expected to take up the matter in spring. 
The sad news now tonight from the San Diego Zoo, two of their Asian elephants were euthanized this week. Zoo officials say 43-year-old Cha-Cha and 67-year-old Cookie were euthanized for serious and irreversible health problems. There are now five elephants remaining at the zoo and 17 at Safari Park. The crew of a San Diego-based Navy ship rescued 13 Iranian fishermen and took 15 suspected pirates into custody in the northern Arabian Sea on Thursday. You're going to be looking here at home video of the fishermen waving for help. The Navy says a Seahawk helicopter from the USS Kidd spotted a suspected pirate boat next to the fishing boat after receiving a distress call. The Navy believes the pirates used the fishing vessel as a mothership for as many as 45 days while they held the fishermen hostage. In recent days, the Iranian government had complained about the presence of the Kidd and other U.S. ships in the Strait of Hormuz. The Labor Department says the nation added 200,000 jobs in December, pushing the national unemployment rate down to 8.5 percent. It is the fourth straight month the country has added at least 100,000 jobs. KPBS business reporter Eric Anderson joins us in the KPBS newsroom. And Eric, what do the national numbers mean for California? Well, as you would expect, they are good news for California. We're not going to find out until next week just how good the news is. That's when the state's unemployment rate comes out and the local unemployment rate as well. I did speak today with San Diego State University economist Dan Seaver. And what he told me was that, of course, some of the job gains that occurred nationally did happen here in California. So that's a good thing. But he said, most importantly, when the nation's economy is doing well, that is good for California. He also said that California does have job-related problems it has to deal with. The state budget mess is continuing to happen. That means the state is going to be shedding jobs in the coming year. And local governments dealing with these state funding shortfalls are going to be shedding jobs as well. But what the Labor Department said today was 200,000 jobs added nationally just in the month of December, fourth straight month of at least 100,000 jobs added, and that's 1.6 million jobs over the course of the year. That's very good because compared to the year before, the nation only added a little bit less than a million jobs. KPBS business reporter Eric Anderson, thank you. Gas prices keep going up throughout the county. The average price of a gallon of regular self-serve gas rose today for the 15th consecutive day. The overnight one-and-a-half cent rise brings the cost to $3.70 per gallon. That makes the average price about seven and a half more cents than a week ago and a month ago. It's also 35 cents higher than last year at this time. A setback today for the developers who want to build a condominium complex on the north edge of Little Italy, across the street from solar turbines. Staff of the Center of City Development recommended a no vote on the Fat City Lofts project. They say the complex would not be consistent with the community plan or San Diego's general plan. The developers say they'll go to court if the project is rejected. And an effort to block the California DREAM Act has failed. The so-called DREAM Act is a state law that allows public financial aid for college students who are not legal citizens. Opponents of the law failed to collect enough signatures to put the repeal effort on the November ballot. The June ballot will also include some hotly contested issues for San Diego voters. Amitha Sharma tells us what we can expect to see on that ballot. The 2012 promises to be a big political and some might say a make or break year for the city of San Diego's finances. Key issues will play out on the June ballot when San Diegans will cast votes for a new mayor and for pension reform. Michael Smullins, politics and government editor for UT San Diego, and Scott Lewis, CEO of VoiceofSanDiego.org, are here with me to talk about the candidates and the issues. There are four candidates on the ballot in June for mayor. Councilman Carl DeMaio, District Attorney Bonnie Dumanis, Assemblyman Nathan Fletcher, and Congressman Bob Filner. Let's talk about DeMaio first. Scott, okay. he has a knack for going to the public to get support or backing for his positions like pension reform. How does he do this? Why does he do this? Well, think, if you think about San Diego's political conversation as an amoeba, right? It's just this flowing amoeba. He's, he has a tendency and a very good talent for stepping outside of it 
And then everybody kind of corrects to his debates. He's able to frame debates in the way that he wants to, you know, and, and, and really once you frame the debate, then, then you win it. If you, if you convince somebody that they're talking about what color fridge they're going to get, they've already agreed to buy the fridge, right? <laughs> And so I think that he's very good at that, and he's realized that, that he, a person in his power can, can garner the kind of attention that, uh, that um, you know, other people envy all the time. And he can say, you know, this is the way it should be. Combine that with his encyclopedic knowledge of city issues and the policies at hand, and he comes off as a very uh, clued-in person about who can do this. Now, he does turn a few people off, and we'll see if he can handle that. But that's, uh, that's made him a very powerful person. He riles people up. At these, at these events, at these community um, hearings and, and discussions, and he gets them fired up for, for change. And now, you know, whether you like what he's proposing or not is the issue. Well, so he riles people up. He also seems to inspire dislike. He's an arch conservative, yet there are people within his own party who viscerally dislike him. Why? Well, you know, he's not the establishment's candidate, and that's not necessarily a good or bad thing, but that's sort of the reality. Uh, he and Mayor Jerry Sanders, who are both Republicans, have feuded almost since the day he was, he's been on the city council. Uh, he's a polarizing figure. Um, Labor had a, a candidate's forum, and Bob Filner, the lone Democrat, and Nathan Fletcher went. DeMaio did not. At that point, uh, Bonnie Dumanis was saying she wasn't participating because it was too early. But uh, that just sort of sh shows, you know, he, he has antagonized Labor um, because of his stance on the pension thing. They, they hate that. They dislike that. And so... That's a potential liability. You know, Scott pointed out his, his assets in terms of his ability to really drive the issues and the discussion, but he is a polarizing figure among the, the, the th four of them more so than the others. District Attorney Bonnie Dumanis unveiled a plan to fix San Diego's schools, yet she has been less than candid on where she stands on city issues, okay. like the 2010 unsuccessful sales tax increase proposal okay. and pension reform. How is that going to affect her candidacy? Well, you know, I think it's, it's kind of weird for us to assume that it would be natural for her to talk about the Charger Stadium when the Chargers say that it's, you know, that the reason they need this investment is for the competitiveness on the field, what, you're, what people are basically arguing if they say that she shouldn't talk about schools is that they think it's more important for her to talk about the competitive nature or the competitiveness of our professional football team. But we're talking about basic city right. issues. Right. So like now finances. she's going to have to answer that question. How is she going to handle the city finances? But I think it's perfectly legitimate for somebody to say that a priority of the city should be education. Now, uh, she's going to have to deal with, with those consequences. She wants to create a Department of Education. Where, the mo where is the money going to be for that in a city that has a gigantic pension bill that it's never put aside the money to handle? But I don't think it's wrong for somebody to say, look, mass transit, airports, or education is something that I want the city to focus on. Now, um, uh, again, whether she handles the things that other people are worried about will determine, but maybe she's calculating that, look, I can prioritize this more than, more than the chargers or more than something else. I think that's perfectly legitimate. We'll see if it actually works out. So. Michael, Assemblyman Nathan Fletcher seems to be a rising star in his party. He's gotten people to open his wallets for him. He, um, has, he also seems to have the backing of the unions at least the police union at this point. What are his strengths? What are his weaknesses? Well, just on the union issue, I think Bob Filner has the union backing. The, the Police Office Association is a little bit of a different animal that they sometimes will go with a, a Republican uh, in certain cases because of law enforcement issues. Republicans tend to at least uh, have the impression that they're stronger on, on those issues. Um, but I think before Bonnie DeManis got in the race, Nathan Fletcher was going to be the real Republican establishment candidate. He was very close to the mayor, and a lot of people thought the mayor was almost kind of grooming him or at least showing him the ropes. Uh, he brings a lot of, to the table in terms of, uh, as uh, one of my friends said, the more people are exposed to Nathan Fletcher, the better he does. He's very good. He's very articulate, good-looking. Uh, you know, he's, he's that whole package, and, you know, I'm not saying this insincerely. He comes off as very sincere. What he doesn't have is popular support. The polls we've seen, he still has not moved the needle much. He's getting money, so it'll be interesting to see if he's able to do that. There was uh, some concern that, uh, you know, with both him and Bonnie DeManis in the, the race sort of vying for a lot of the same backing, that they could X each other out, and then you would have DeMaio and, and Bob Filner in the runoff, which is sort of the, the 
downtown establishment's worst nightmare, I think, at this stage. Now, the lone Democrat in this race is Congressman Bob Filner, who, who has come across as believing that the fact that he's a Democrat alone might just help carry the day for him. How realistic is that? Not might. He says that's what's going to happen. He's going to win. Yeah, there's no question in his mind, and I think that's actually his biggest liability because the actual grassroots organization building that needs to happen for you to win a big city mayoral race isn't happening. I think he's turning a lot of people off along the way. You mentioned that Bonnie DeManis wasn't very candid about her actual views on things like city finances. Well, this guy, Bob Filner, has put out a, he says, I'm going to save hundreds of millions of dollars on the city's pension issue, and we don't have to cut employee benefits. Don't worry, it's a fantastic plan. And you say, where is it at? And it's been, it's been month after month after month, and he has not produced it. Um, you know, but on the other hand, he's been more conservative on things like the Chargers. You know, whereas DeMaio is willing to give them money um, up to, you know, $15 million a year or something uh, of taxpayer money. Um, Filner's looked at that and said, look, I'm not giving them that much money unless they give us a stake in the team, which is what developers in L.A. want. And so I think he's had some pretty populist stances that might, that might carry it for him. But the idea that he's guaranteed to be in there for the final election, I don't think stands. Very quickly, I want to move on to pension reform. A financial recovery plan for the city of San Diego is going to dominate this mayoral race. So we've got this pension reform measure on the June ballot. What does it do, Scott, and how much money would it save? Two things. It moves um, new employees of the city of San Diego, so people who are hired from that point forward, into a 401k pension instead of a guaranteed pension from the city. The other thing it does is recommend or mandate a five-year freeze on current employees' pensionable pay. Um, but you're going to wake up, they're going to pass this, it's a very popular thing, they're going to pass it, but they're going to wake up and still see that there's a pension problem in the city because the current employees whose benefits went up, 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 and up, um, they still maintain those benefits, and so there's never been money set aside to pay for them, and that, the, that liability acts as a big wet blanket on the city finances right now, and it's the reason why so many you know, rec centers are closing and that sort of thing. What about an alternative plan to this? Is there one that's going to surface? I think in the next few, few weeks you'll see the Democratic members of the city council put up something because they've realized that this is so popular it's probably going to pass. The only way to blunt it or stop it is to confuse it. And so perhaps they put their own pension reform ballot measure up that could possibly get more votes or just confuse the issue enough that, that people both just say no to both. So I, I expect that. Um, but again, we've been hearing that there's an alternative for months and, and Bob Filner has yet to produce it. So we'll see what happens. You know, the longstanding argument against pension reform is if you do this, you're simply not going to attract highly qualified workers to the city of San Diego. What do you say to that? Well, that's been the argument uh, throughout. Um, we'll have to see. Uh, you know, right now, that's a tough argument to make. The uh, job market is horrible, and I don't think you would see people balking at a city job uh, with a 401k style benefit. Uh, you know, even though the defined pension is, is more desirable. In the long haul, we'll, we'll have to see. One of the things that the, the, the pension reform plan does or the, the initiative does is it still protects the defined pension for police officers. That's the key area where they say that's where they may hurt and lose people to other um, uh, agencies uh, if they don't have a good benefit. Councilman DeMaio has said that he plans the future for something similar for, for firefighters or for police officers. So I think that's why they've come out against this. And also the idea that if you close the pension to most people, then the burden of maintaining the pension that remains will fall on the, on the current members, and that, that, could get, um, that could get costly as well. And so I think that, again, you're going to wake up the day after this is passed, and there's still going to be financial problems at the city of San Diego, and there's going to be people like DeMaio who use that to their political advantage. And we'll see you know, whether we can ever emerge from this fog of, of crisis and actually build things out of the city in the future. But um, for now, we have to deal with it. We're going to wrap it up there. Gentlemen, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Thank you. And there's a bit of Hollywood right here in San Diego. In a moment, we'll show you a company that does 3D magic with films shot in two dimensions. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS, it's Washington Week at 8 o'clock with host Gwen Eiffel. It's PBS's longest-running public affairs series featuring Washington's top journalists analyzing the week's news. Then at 8.30, broadcast media and the web unites with input from an engaged audience for an innovative way to deliver the news. And at 9, it's great performances. Herbie Hancock, Gustavo Dudumel, and the L.A. Philharmonic celebrate Gershwin. That's all tonight on KPBS. 
I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. Gwen Ifill talks with New Hampshire Republicans ahead of Tuesday's primary. Plus, Shields and Brooks. That's Friday on the PBS News Hour. The American people have named PBS the most trusted source of news and public affairs for the eighth year in a row. Trust. The American people have spoken. Thank you. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by The Academy of Motion Pictures just announced the 10 films that remain in competition for the Visual Effects Oscar. Three of the films had 2D to 3D conversion done here in San Diego. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando takes a look at the work done by Legend 3D. Founded in 2001, Legend 3D has made a name for itself as an innovator in converting flat two-dimensional images to 3D. The company has worked on more than a dozen major Hollywood productions, including Alice in Wonderland, The Smurfs, <gasps> all three Shreks, yeah, wow. and most recently, Hugo. For the crucial climax of Hugo, the Legend team tapped into both its 2D and 3D toolbox to work on George Melies' footage from more than a century ago. George Melies was one of the first visual effects pioneers. What he did was absolutely magical, and here we were able to take that and turn it into 3D the way he might have done it. It was beautiful footage for, as it was originally shot because it's so fantastical. It's got kind of a theatrical sense about it with these uh, in-camera special effects where they would you know, use a lot of uh, a very basic early compositing of film over film optical techniques. When we get footage like this that's vintage, you are maintaining the integrity of the technology at the time by helping match and preserve that feel. The result is a charming mix of vintage images rendered with state-of-the-art 3D conversion technology. Legend 3D visual effects producer Matthew Akee explains the geometry of stereoscopic 3D conversion. Z-axis re uh, basically refers to space um, on an infinite line that comes, you know, negative space, which is outside of the screen of, of, you know, your TV or your theater, and then positive spaces, you know, coming this direction on that line. So you got your east-west X, your north-south Y, and then your Z-space, which is how far away your distance is to the screen or outside of the screen. Using silent footage of Harold Lloyd, a key explains how 3D can be used for impact. We really wanted to exaggerate the nature of how high in the area was. So within the Z-axis, there's a lot of space and positive space away from the screen plane where you see all the way down the block and it feels very, very deep and far away from you. Um, you know, there's a certain level of creativity and understanding of what that will do psychologically to a viewer's perception of an image or a, a, a longer sequence of images. They're taking 2D content and ultimately turning it into what your eyes truly see in real life, which is two lenses that connect at a certain point of focus and actually have a lot of depth perception. Legend 3D founder Barry Sandrew says live action films have been easier than animated ones like the Smurfs and the Shrek films. And in all of those situations, we have characters with pristine lines and pristine everything. So you have to be even more meticulous in terms of making sure everything is clean and everything is in, in 3D looks natural. With the Smurfs and Gargamel and some of the, the cool effects moments of their battles, we bring them out and we shoot lightning bolts out at the audience and they give the kids a little bit of that tickle, you know, it's kind of fun. And then, uh, you know, a movie like Transformers, it's all about scope. It's about an entire city, you know, war, giant warring robots blowing up skyscrapers. Which brings us to the film Sandrew is most proud of. That's easy. Transformers. Uh, one robot had 78,000 pieces and we had to somehow bring it into our process and make every aspect of that robot accurate in terms of volume and 3D and also take all of the practical effects like real fire and cars flipping and everything he does and make it all look seamless. There's you know, shots that can last anywhere from you know, 10 seconds to a minute in, in duration and they're tracking with helicopters and flying all over the place with all sorts of backgrounds. You can imagine the work it takes not just to do a single frame and establish death but to follow that when explosions happen and there's a zillion dust particles that you literally have to place in different levels of depth. I mean there's a lot of work throughout the shot. You could have 10 or 15 layers up to something like Transformers where we had uh, you know, 100 to 150 layers. You know, every layer has to be treated as an element that has to have some level of depth and some creative design to it. Transformers 3 is one of 10 films on the shortlist in the running for a visual effects Oscar. 
Half of the films this year were released in 3D, and Legend worked on three of those. So Sandrew isn't worried that 3D is a passing fad. There's too much momentum in the consumer electronics industry, the exhibitors, the studios. Uh, there's just too much going in that direction to, for it to stop. Next up for Legend 3D is something that also has a San Diego tie, Top Gun. The company will be converting the 1986 film for an upcoming 3D theatrical release. That was KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando. You can find out more about Legend 3D on Beth's Cinema Junkie blog at kpbs.org. This is KPBS Evening Edition. The world was in a dream before the war, but now it's woken up and said goodbye to it. Tell him what's in your heart. Dear Lord, I beg you to keep him safe. Hi, I'm Elsa Sevilla. If you find yourself hearing about a great program on KPBS after it's already aired, we have a solution. Get notified about your favorite TV programs on KPBS before they air by subscribing to the TV Highlights email alert. This daily email will feature the best programs coming up right here on KPBS TV, so you can make a date to tune in or plan to record it. It's easy to register. Just go to kpbs.org slash alerts. Welcome back to the Public Square on KPBS Evening Edition. Last night we told you about Governor Jerry Brown's plan to cut education funds and increase taxes if voters don't approve his tax initiative. We asked you what you thought of his plan and if there are other or better options. Here's what a few of you had to say. Summer on Facebook said, Our school system has very little left to cut. I would gladly pay higher taxes if it meant keeping our schools viable. These may be hard times, but it's our future workforce who is is getting shorted. And from Jose on Facebook, taxes are not the problem. Revenue is. People need to understand that if they want the things a modern progressive society has, then they need to be, then it needs to be paid for. I like public schools, libraries, highways, and bridges, and I prefer that they are not dilapidated and collapsing. That was from Jose on Facebook. You can weigh in on any of the topics we've talked about tonight on Twitter, Facebook, or just email us at jfarian at kpbs.org. Recapping some of tonight's top stories, the San Diego-based USS Kidd rescued an Iranian fishing boat that was held for more than 40 days by suspected pirates. And huge waves forced the closure of Ocean Beach Pier for several hours today. The Weather Service has issued a high surf advisory that will be in effect until tomorrow afternoon. You can watch and comment on any of the stories you saw tonight on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great evening, and we leave you with a look at the forecast.